clay gas and mnemonics, some hopefully helpful memory tricks to help you remember terminology regarding RNA and DNA, all out of the pureness of my heart, which you might say is pure as gold, which brings me to my first pure as gold. As in the purines are adenine and guanine. So the others, thymine, cytosine, and uracil must be the pyrimidines. Um, and so the purines are the ones with the two rings and you can remember that they have two rings because I kind of think of it as like, they're pure, they've got it all, which isn't really like how it works. Like it's not like the other ones just lost it. But if you think about it that way, you can kind of remember that the purines are the ones that are like pure, they have everything. They've got these two rings and then the other ones must be the pyrimidines and they must be the single rings. So we have the purines and the pyrimidines. When we're talking about mutations, if a mutation changes a purine to a pyrimidine or vice versa, um, you we call it a transition because you're transitioning to like a new type. And if it goes from like a purine to another purine or if it goes from a pyrimidine to another pyrimidine, we call it a transversion, you're kind of changing to a new version of that same type. So those are the main nucleobases and um, we'll talk later about how they can join up um, and how they pair up. But what if you just want a one letter abbreviation? Well, the A, T, C, G, U, those parts are easy. But what if you don't know the sequence? What if you just know it's some, of, some letter? Um, then you can put in an N to stand for any um, you could have had. And if you want to specify like a purine, um, that'd be an R, so a purine, like the R, um, remember that. And then you have pure as gold, so that's an A or a G and a Y, a pyrimidine, um, so that'd be your C, T, or U. And so sometimes you might see this in the context of like ordering a random primer, or if there's some sort of like consensus sequence that a protein likes to bind here, if there's a purine, but not a pyrimidine, you might see like an R um, there and that sort of thing. You might also see a T in front to specify deoxynucleotide. Um, and so here I was talking in terms of nucleotides, but we can also be talking in terms of nucleosides and nucleobases. So let's get into some of the terminology. Um, between these, and I can never remember sometimes, and I have to think back to these mnemonics. Um, but the nucleobase, so that's just like the part, it's, it's just the ringy part. So this is the part, it's just, well, it's the really important part. It's going to allow them to form these specific base pairs that are going to let you have these strands of DNA stick together and all of this one serve as a template for the other and all of this really awesome stuff. Um, but only that part alone wouldn't be enough because you need the other parts to help link it together. And so those other parts are going to be a sugar. Um, and then you have phosphate groups added on. When you just have the sugar and the nucleobase, you have a nucleoside. Um, so side think sugar. So you have add the sugar and you get a nucleoside, but you just have the sugar. So nucleoside is just the sugar. Then when you add phosphate groups on, you get a nucleotide. What can be confusing is that when we're talking about the nucleotide, so when we're talking about the versions with the phosphate groups, we have two, there are different numbers of phosphate groups that they can have. So you can have, for example, take adenosine. You can have adenosine monophosphate, adenosine diphosphate, adenosine triphosphate, where they have one, two, or three phosphate groups. Now that we're using the term adenosine, we're talking about it in the term of its nucleoside. So if we want to talk about this in generic form, we would talk about a nucleoside monophosphate, a nucleoside diphosphate, a nucleoside triphosphate, because it would be redundant if we talked about the nucleotide triphosphate, we have to talk about the nucleoside and remember side sugar. Um, and so we're talking about the sugar and then how many phosphates we have added on. And um, this is why we talk about the nucleoside of phosphate. Um, but remember that when we're doing like you're adding it to your PCR reaction, you're adding the nucleotides. But if you want to describe how many phosphate groups they have, you need to talk about it in terms of the nucleoside, blah, blah, phosphate. Um, just a quick note, a little off track, but sometimes we actually add um, drug analogs, the antivirals or something, might be a nucleoside analog or a nucleotide analog. If it's up in the nucleoside analogs, and what happens is that your cells can actually add the phosphate groups on and then they're a modified version though, so the virus tries to use them and then it messes up. Um, and they have like better, um, our, cell, our copying machinery is typically smarter and so it doesn't mess up and use those. The viral machinery does, and that could be a way to target viruses. But anyway, I was just saying that like often they're added, you see drugs that are nucleoside analogs. But getting back to, um, getting back to our main purpose of this all. Okay, so getting back to the DNA and the RNA, some more terminology. So let's talk about how these different 
nucleotides um, can pair up to one another, or I guess the nucleobases are the ones doing the actual pairing. And so we'll just talk about the nucleobases and then hopefully I won't confuse the other terminology. So the nucleobases are able to form these hydrogen bonds, these base pairs, which are basically these, just these like partial charge, partial charge attractions. And this is going to help give the specificity where you can have two strands of DNA um, complement one another, or you can have like DNA and RNA complement one another, or RNA and RNA complement one another. They have this one-to-one -one relationship where you have A base pairs with T and G base pairs with C, and you also have A base pair with U. Um, so in all of these cases, you have one purine and one pyrimidine, and therefore you have this constant struct, this constant width of DNA. So you can remember that you always have to have one purine and one pyrimidine. Then you remember pure is gold, um, adenine and guanine. Those are not going to be base pairing with one another. Um, and so they have to be base pairing with other things. Um, and you can remember that G and C bind to one another uh, because the or not because, but you can remember that G and C look similar and therefore remember, oh yeah, so G must bind with C. Um, and that leaves A and T and to A and U. Um, okay, and then in terms of the strength, so you can see that G and C are forming these three hydrogen bonds and A and T are forming two. So that's one of the reasons why GC regions are like more, um, like stuck together. So, but it's not the only reason, it's not even the main reason. The main reason actually has to do with like the base stacking. So in the DNA, when they're joined together, they have like the bases are stacking on one another and you get these like partial charge attractions from these aromatic rings kind of like syncing up together. Uh, more of this in another post, but basically this is to say that the hydrogen bonding is only one of the reasons why you have that stronger interaction. But Regardless, you have that stronger interaction where the GC regions, they're more like glued together. So you remember G glued. Um, and speaking of GC rich and AT rich regions, I mean, you often hear those terms to use and just remember, like, it's not that you necessarily have GC, 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 or AT, AT, AT. You might have GG on one strand and GCC on the other strand, but they're GC rich because you have um, two strands of DNA. DNA is typically double-stranded and RNA. Um, is often single-stranded, although it can like fold up into a bunch of structures. And so RNA is often has like loops and all sorts of cool stuff like that. DNA, you have these double strands and they twist into this helix, um, right-handed helix. Um, so you want to do a right hand, put your right thumbs up. And if, so when you see a double helix, put your right thumbs up. If the, um, if it follows the groove, then the designer was in luck. Um, so sometimes you might see people like have the, there might be like a structure of DNA and it actually has the wrong groove, but DNA is this right-handed helix. So if you put your right finger and you kind of follow that, um, you should get, that should align with the DNA. Um, and you can also see that DNA, when it forms this helix, it has this, this minor groove and this major groove. And this, the minor groove is minor, it's like smaller, and then the major groove is bigger. And when there are different proteins that need to say, like read out the sequence of DNA without having to, they don't want to have to actually like unzip the DNA. Um, and so they can actually get information out of these grooves without having to separate the strands. And they can do this because although there are some of the groups that are being used um, to, to bind to one another in these two strands, um, that basically when you have these nuclear bases, they're forming these hydrogen bonds with one another using like one side of themselves, but then there are other, um, other interactions that can still form with the remaining groups that weren't used um, and proteins can read these out. Um, in more technical, you, so you have like different things that you're seeing in the minor group versus the major group and you can get more information out of the major group. In the minor group, you can, you can tell that it's, if something is like a GC or a CG versus an AT or TA. So you can tell like one of these versus one of these, but you can't tell this versus this and you can't tell this versus this. So you can't tell like an AT versus a TA or GC versus a CG in the minor groove, but you can tell them apart in the major groove. So if you look at the minor groove, this is what you would be seeing if you were a protein. You were, so you would have a hydrogen bond acceptor, a donor acceptor, acceptor, donor acceptor in the minor groove, that's the same. In the major groove though, you would see an acceptor, acceptor, donor, and then hydrogen, hydrogen, donor, acceptor, acceptor. So you can tell apart which one is on which strands. Um, similarly, 
um, with A versus T. And here I actually have a memory helper that I used in undergrad. Um, aha, Adam ate a tomato. Um, and so, aha, you have A, A, K in the minor groove. And then Adam um, ate. So this A, T would be an Adam. And then a tomato. So we have T, A would be a M, A, D, A. Um, and so I don't know if that helps you. Um, but I found that helpful um, when I was trying to remember them in undergrad. Um, so just to review these really quick, we have pure as gold. The purines are adenine and guanine, and they have two rings because they've got it all. And so the others must be the others. Um, if you're going from a purine to a chromatine, you're transitioning. It's a transition mutation. If it's from a purine to another purine or from a permidine to another permidine, it's a transversion mutation. Um, this can come up sometimes when you're talking about different mutations and the, like different mutagens, different chemicals that can cause mutations. They might have different signatures, like they cause more transitions or they cause more transversions. Um, in terms of abbreviations, when you see an N that's standing for any nucleotide, you see an R that's a purine, pure R, um, or you see a Y that's a pyrimidine, um, so that you get the Y in there. Um, sometimes, but not always, you'll see like a D in front to specify if you're talking about a deoxynucleotide. Um, sometimes it's just in the context, so you might not. If they are, you know that you're talking about DNA, you might not specify them. Um, the nucleobases, um, so those are just the ring parts. And remember, these ring parts are the parts that actually do the hydrogen bonding that give them the specificity between the strands. Um, those add together with a sugar um, to give you a nucleoside. So you have a side of sugar. When those nucleosides then get phosphate groups added so that they can link up and do cool stuff, then they become nucleotides. But when we talk about nucleotides, when we talk about how many phosphate groups that they have, we have to talk about them in terms of the nucleoside version. So we would say a nucleoside triphosphate, et cetera, because if we said nucleotide triphosphate, that would be redundant because the nucleoside is the one that gets the phosphate groups added on. And once it gets the phosphate added, groups added on, now it's a nucleotide. Okay, um, so we also have that specific base pairing where we have A to T or TU um, and then G to C. Remember that G to C, G and C look pretty kind of similar, the letters at least. Um, and so they form these bonds together and these bonds on GC rich regions are more sticky. Um, they're more gluey, so G glue. Um, and the reason why is because one, they have these three instead of two hydrogen bonds, but also more importantly is how the bases are stacking and basically a little different orientation and things. And you get these better um, base stacking interactions which make these regions stronger. But at the end of the day, what you have is a stronger region. You have more glue in your GC rich regions. Um, you're always going to have a purine and a pyrimidine go together so that you have a constant width of this helix. And within this helix, you can tell different things, whether you're looking at the, looking from the minor groove or the major groove. You're going to be able to, in the minor groove, only tell apart whether it's like a GC or a CG versus an AT or TA. But you can't tell G versus C or C versus G, A versus T or T versus A. Um, but in the major groove, you can tell them all apart. And for the, um, for the AT versus TA, you can remember, aha, Adam ate a tomato. And that is some memory tricks that I hope can help you when you're trying to remember various terminology regarding nucleic acids.